In today's scripture reading, people are lining up and waiting to see Jesus, a scene somewhat similar to scenes of people lining up today to receive COVID-19 vaccines at immunization centers. Jesus and four of his students have just left the synagogue. They've gone to Simon's home, and Simon's mother-in-law is confined to bed with a fever. Jesus takes her hand, helps her to stand. The fever leaves her. Word of what Jesus has done spreads. People begin gathering at Simon's house, bringing members of the community who can't get there on their own, people who were sick with various diseases. Jesus heals them. They arrive sick, diseased, they leave well and healed. Biblical anthropologists refer to Jesus as a folk healer who probably used various folk remedies and practices to help people. For people of the Hebrew faith, a healer was an intermediary between the person who is ill and God. It is God who heals through the person of a healer, in this case, Jesus. People came so that in the presence of Jesus, it is God who will declare them to be well, and God will restore them to their place in the community. Today, many who write about healing will often distinguish between what they call disease and illness. A disease is a physical problem in need of cure. Illness concerns the emotional, the social impacts resulting from the disease. Illness has to do with the meaning of one's life when one can no longer earn a living, can no longer do the things that have shaped how people see you and relate to you and respect you. In Simon's house, Jesus the healer was changing the way people saw each other and saw themselves. No longer were they the diseased, the impure, the not to be touched or associated with, but now they were God's blessed. They were honored members of the community again. We're told those possessed with demons were also brought to Jesus. Remember, this is occurring in a land occupied by Rome and the Roman military. Even today, people living in occupied militarized lands will experience trauma and exhibit, exhibit physical signs of being possessed by a militarized spirit. Sometimes they scream and convulse or they just grow silent or lethargic or paralyzed. They're alive but not living, living but not alive. Jesus won't let the demons speak to him because we're told they know him. In that culture, you did not allow your public self, your, your private self to be publicly revealed. Jesus would not allow the demons to reveal himself as the Holy One of God. And it's the demons who most clearly realize that Jesus is changing everything. He's upending the rules, the protocols, the divisive labels and categories that exist between the well and the diseased. Jesus was casting out the demon that separated and segregated people. Like many biblical stories, this one sounds odd to us, coming from a different time, culture, and place. I think it also sounds odd because Jesus is creating a new story, and sadly enough, that new story is still new to us today. People came to that house because something outside of their usual realm of experience was happening in that house. God was present in that house. God's presence of healing was in that house. Today, we still too often have a world that separates the clean and the unclean, the acceptable and the unacceptable, those who are welcomed, those who are not welcomed, the included, the excluded, the entitled, the impoverished. Jesus walks into our house just as he walked into that first century house and interrupts our defined world, shuffles the definitions, reassigns place settings. Just when we think we have things figured out, Jesus changes it. Just when we religious people think that we can get away by saying we hate the sin and love the sinner, Jesus points out that when we actually apply that teaching to people, we usually end up being much better at hating than at loving. This gospel story was written by someone who had chosen to follow Jesus. And following Jesus means allowing oneself to become a source of newness in the world, just as Jesus was a source of newness in his world. It means that when we hear this story, we don't just desire Jesus to heal us of whatever dis-ease and divisions exist in our lives, but we hear it choosing to embody the Christ presence in the houses, buildings, streets, arenas, schools, stores, places that we enter. The story tells us that people are to experience God's healing presence when we are present. People should not experience us as someone who judges them or ignores them or talks over them or puts them down. We should be a healing presence. 
We should be ensuring people that they have been listened to, they have been heard, that they have been cared about, that they matter, that they have been affirmed as an honored member of the community and a beloved child of God. Let me conclude with a story Shane Claiborne tells in his book, The Irresistible Revolution. Claiborne is a member of the Simple Way community in Philadelphia. He tells of the day that he and Michelle, another Simple Way member, went out to get a loaf of bread. Their walk took them through a nearby area known for prostitution and drug trafficking. They walked past an alley in which there was a woman on crutches wearing tattered clothes. She approached Claiborne and asked if he wanted her services. They hurried on to the store. They got the bread on the way back. They just nodded as, at the woman as they passed. However, when they got back to the Simple Way house, they discovered there was a rip in the side of the bag. The bread was stale, so they had to go back to the store. This time as they passed the alley, they saw the woman crying. They went on to the store, bought their bread, and on the way back, they again saw her crying. And this time they felt they couldn't just pass by. So they stopped, they talked to her. They told her that they cared about her, that she was precious. They invited her back to her, their home, a safe place where she could get warm and have something to eat. So the woman got her crutches and went with them. Now quoting Claiborne, he writes, as soon as we entered the house, she started weeping hysterically. Michelle held her as she wept. When she had gained her composure, she said, you're all Christians, aren't you? Michelle and I looked at each other startled. We had said nothing about God or Jesus, and our house doesn't have a cross in the window, a neon Jesus saves sign, or even a little Christian fish on the wall. She said, I know you are Christians because you shine. I used to be in love with Jesus like that. And when I was, I shined like diamonds in the sky, like the stars. But it's a cold, dark world. And I lost my shine a little while back. I lost my shine on all those streets. At that point, we were all weeping. She asked us to pray with her that she might shine again. We did. We prayed that that dark world would not take away our shine. Days, weeks went by. We did not see her. And then one day there was a knock at the door and I opened it. And on the steps was a lovely lady with a contagious ear-to-ear -ear smile. We stared at each other. We see a lot of people. So I was going to try to fake recognizing her. But she called my bluff and beat me to it. Of course you don't recognize me because I'm shining again. And then I knew. She went on to explain how deeply she had fallen in love with God again. Again, she was both living and alive. In Jesus, people discovered God's healing. They discovered that they regained their shine. God shines through Jesus. And Jesus invites us to allow God to shine through us, that we may be healers in our world, that we might be those who bear God's healing, and that we might help people shine with God's love. Thanks be to God. Amen.